please welcome your host for this evening, Dr. Lindsay Hoffman. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ninth annual National Agenda Speaker Series. I'm so delighted to bring our second cartoonist under my wing of doing this. I think political cartooning is such an important part of the history of a democracy, uh, whether it's from the right or the left. Um, I'm from the Center for Political Communication, the associate director there, and this year's theme, as you know, is direction democracy. We're looking at where we've been, where we're going, and where we're at in this historic uh, 240 plus years of democracy in this country. So I'd like to remind our audience, I know it's annoying, that civil dialogue is vital to the success of our program. So let's agree to be candid, but also courteous of others' views. We'll have an audience Q&A at the end of the event tonight. So you can tweet us using hashtag Udell Agenda if you'd like your question asked, or you can just show up your question in, in the Q&A. So tonight, without further ado, Rob Rogers is an award-winning, nationally syndicated editorial cartoonist, formerly with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, formerly being kind of the most important part of his story. His cartoons have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and USA Today. Of his many awards, most recently Rogers was awarded the Berryman Award from the National Press Foundation. He's also been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. So please give a big University of Delaware, big blue hen welcome to Rob Rogers. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Appreciate it. So thank you, Rob, for being here. Sure. I'm going to sit. Uh, okay. You have a presentation you've already prepared, so I do. let's I do. get into it. Uh, can everybody see that? Is that big enough? Uh, am I blocking you if I stand here? OK. All right, because uh, sometimes I like to look up at my own work and admire it. Uh, <laughs> uh, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's exciting to be here. And, and what's a blue hen? I mean, what is that? I mean, <laughs> it's a fighting blue hen. It's ferocious. <laughs> OK, I just need, I need to see what that looks like. I want to draw one, but I don't know quite what it looks like. I know I, I, I'm getting that it's blue, uh, and it's probably a hen, but OK. Anyway, I, as she mentioned, I'm from Pittsburgh, where it pretty much rains every day, so I'm happy to be here in, in Delaware, uh, where it only rains on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> uh, I was told that would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so editorial cartooning has a long history in this country, starting with Them Damn Pictures uh, today, uh, because them damn pictures is a phrase that was used by Boss Tweed to talk about the work of Thomas Nast. And Thomas Nast was a political cartoonist in New York City around the turn of the last century, two centuries ago. And, uh, oh, there it is. Oh, sorry, it's going too fast. Hold on. Um, and this cartoon is one that he did. That's Boss Tweed as the vulture over New York uh, State or New York City, and uh, the bones of the Treasury and and the rent payer and all of that. He was very corrupt, and um, and the caricature that Thomas Nast did of Boss Tweed became very famous and was distributed around the world. That'll be important in the story later. Um, this is what Boss Tweed said. He said, I don't care so much what the papers write. My constituents can't read. It's them damn pictures. Uh, so this is just to illustrate the importance of editorial cartooning over the, over the years uh, in this country. Um, here's another, another cartoon by Thomas Nast. This is Who Stole the People's Money? Do Tell. And uh, it was him. And everybody's pointing at each other. The, this sort of the circling firing, uh, cir uh, circling firing squad there, circular firing squad. But more importantly, even before Thomas Nast, we had people like Ben Franklin and Paul Revere, founding fathers who you know their history of this country, but you may not know that they were also editorial cartoonists. This is uh, Ben Franklin's famous join or die cartoon where he has the snake split up into all of the different colonies trying to get people to joined together to oppose the crown. And um, this cartoon became very famous and was used even uh, years later uh, after the revolution again. Um, this was Paul Revere's print of the Boston Massacre, 
which also rallied people to get behind the revolution. So even the founding fathers were into political cartooning in a way that, you know, many people don't know about. So, so it's very important to our history. Now moving forward, uh, here we have a Herblock cartoon from 1950 where he coined the phrase McCarthyism, and there's all these buckets of tar and, and the, the Republican elephant of the 1950 uh, convention is saying, you mean I'm supposed to stand on that? And then later, of course, Herblock became famous for all of his cartoons about Nixon. Uh, I am not a crook. Uh, here's a Paul Conrad cartoon. Conrad was the one cartoonist that did end up on Nixon's enemies list, so his name. Uh, he says, I'm sorry, I don't recognize any of them. And of course, it's Nixon looking at uh, his own mugshot. I mean, yeah, Nixon looking at his own mugshot. So um, those are just a few of my heroes, Conrad and Herblock, but there, there are many more. Um, I've been drawing for uh, political cartoons for over 30 years, and so I've drawn a lot of presidents. So one of the things I wanted to illustrate here is how it's sort of unusual that a political cartoonist who's drawing cartoons about a president would be fired for doing his job. <laughs> but that's what happened. So um, I started out with the... Uh, where am I pointing this? Back towards the back. <laughs> hey! It's... Uh, there you go. Oh, okay. So, so I started uh, drawing Reagan, uh, Reagan cartoons uh, during, during the middle of Reagan's presidency. This was his re-election campaign in 84. But he, he was meeting with the Russians, and, uh, and Gorbachev uh, was going to meet with him, but he says, um, uh, he's agreed to meet with you, but he won't wear the costume. <laughs> Little Star Wars reference there. Um, okay. Uh, next came George H.W. Bush. Uh, who was the, the following president, and he, of course, was famous for uh, his flip-flopping on taxes, so there he is. You may remember his famous, uh, his famous line about, um, you know, read my lips, no new taxes. Um, okay, so this one is Bill Clinton, obviously. He's, um, he's the next president, and this was a famous... Uh, Cartoon, he's saying, did I mention the economy is doing great? And of course, we see the next. <laughs> did I mention the economy is doing great? So, so yeah, so Clinton, even the Democrats, you know, you could make fun of the Democrats. That was, that was fine. Um, and I think that it, you know, people, people used to call up to the newspaper when I was drawing cartoons about George W. Bush and say, well, why don't you ever make fun of Clinton? So I'd go back and I'd pull out all the cartoons I did on Clinton and say, well, there was this one, this one, and this one, and then they go, oh, okay. You know, <clears throat> here's another one about Clinton and the guy is saying, is it possible to just impeach him from the waist down? <laughs> so this, this was a, a, a compilation that I did basically uh, showing um, George uh, W. Bush's caricature and how the caricature sort of evolved over time. And, and one of the things that happened was, uh, you know, his, his face changed. Because I, I, you know, when I start to draw somebody, I, I have to look at pictures of them and figure out how I'm going to draw them. And when I first started drawing George W. Bush, he looked a little bit like that. And that was not that much of an exaggeration. But then the next one was, oops. Next one. Uh, so then we have uh, November 99, and there, you know, his eyes are a little closer together. His, his ears are getting slightly bigger. And then um, uh, there he is in May of 2000, and uh, his ears are bigger. Next one, we have January 2001. His, his eyes are now these little, just little dots. And then next, we have September 2004, and there he is. So that, that was how I drew him for the rest of his term, uh, his rest of the, ne the next four years. So. so in case anyone's unclear, definitely cartooning from the left. Yes, exactly, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, cartoonists are paid to have their own opinions most of the time. And, and I think 99% I think of my colleagues have the same arrangement I had, which was, 
you know, we want you to draw your opinions and your cartoons. So I was a progressive, a liberal cartoonist. I was working for a liberal progressive paper. So it all worked out fine until later, and I'll tell you about that. Um, okay. Maybe I'm, oh, I see what's happening here. I'm hitting the wrong button. Okay. <laughs> so it's all my fault. I thought it was, uh, yeah, okay. I was, blame, the, blame the technology. I was hitting the power button. <laughs> My fault, my apologies to the guys in the back. Okay, here's uh, one of the W cartoons I did. You no longer live un under the iron-fisted regime of the evil Saddam. We're here to liberate you. <laughs> Mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. Mission accomplished. <laughs> I was just telling somebody at dinner that um, I often like to uh, try to fit Nixon in wherever I could. So this was one of those times because I, I came along right after, you know, after Watergate, too late to draw, to draw Nixon. But look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, was, this was Obama, midterm shellacking. This was when uh, the Tea Party sort of got ushered in during middle of his term. And here he is saying, I had a hard time com communicating my message. What did he say? He said he's a hardline communist messiah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, you know, I, I did draw cartoons about, you know, both, you know, conservatives and liberal presidents, but certainly my politics and Obama's politics were more aligned. So it was, you know, it wasn't, they, they weren't the vicious cartoons. I would make fun of them in times like this. Um, but so, yeah, so it really was different, but, but I did try to address as many of the issues as I could with all, you know, no matter whether it was Democrats or Republicans. Uh, here's, a, this was right after Obama, you know, they found and captured and killed uh, Osama bin Laden. And so here he is, I figured, you know, he's like the wicked witch that they could never get. So I, I figured a scene from The Wizard of Oz would be appropriate. Here he is saying, He's not only merely dead, he's really most sincerely dead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and of course, down in the corner, you have a birther who's saying, uh, I'm going to need to see a death certificate. Because <laughs> they never believed anything Obama said or did. Uh, and then, of course, finally, the last president, uh, passing of the torch, and here we go. Uh, <laughs> get ready. <clears throat> so... You know, one of the questions I get asked the most is where do you get your ideas? As if I go down to the local idea store and, you know, pick up a couple ideas for the morning uh, with my coffee. But, um, but it, is, it is kind of a process that's hard to explain, but I'll do my best to explain it a little bit here. Um, so one thing that happens is sometimes ideas come to me visually. Like I see something on the news and it, and it immediately sparks an image and I think, oh my God, I got to draw that. So this was a case in point. This was Benjamin Netanyahu at the United Nations giving a talk about Iran's nuclear capabilities and how, oh, they're going to, you know, they have this big threat. So he shows up, and there he is. And what did he do? He brought a cartoon with him. So he brought this bomb. And I immediately looked at the bomb, and I said, that looks just like a cartoon from the Warner Brothers, you know, bomb. So I drew this. And there's Ahmadinejad saying, okay, who leaked our nuclear bomb design to Netanyahu? <laughs> and of course, there's Wiley E. Coyote looking very, very guilty. <laughs> that was a fun one. Here's, uh, so here's another story that sort of sparked that same image in my head. This was Dick Cheney trying to defend in interrogation techniques and, and saying that it was okay, you know, to torture people. And uh, the CIA had just come out with a torture report. And so I imagined, well, what about our civil liberties? You know, and that immediately made me think of the Statue of Liberty. So I thought, okay, I'll draw Cheney as the Statue of Liberty. So here he is. <laughs> and there he has the torture handbook. And he's saying, bring us your huddled masses yearning to be waterboarded. <laughs> Now, every day I start out with my sketchbook, and this is, an old, this is an old page out of my sketchbook, so forgive me, but this is from 2004, and it was Groundhog's Day, so, so, or it was about to be Groundhog's Day, so I have Groundhog's Day, WMD Intelligence, Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction, remember that? 
and gay marriage in Massachusetts. So those are the topics that I'm working with, you know, and I'm thinking about. And I'm, I sort of mull them over my head. And in, on this particular day, I decided to combine two of those topics and uh, ended up with the uh, finished cartoon here. I mean, that's the, that's the sketch. And then here's the finished cartoon. So the first two topics, Groundhog's Day and WMD Intelligence. There's Punxsutawney Phil and Bush is saying, I was wrong about him having weapons of mass destruction, but he was still a threat. <laughs> and of course, no one wants six more weeks of winter. So, you know, of course he was a threat. Uh, but that's, that's sometimes how my mind works. I, I, I look at two topics that are very different and very disparate, and I think, oh, what if I combine those? That would be a surprise. And yet, it still gets the point across that I need to get across, while also getting punks of Tony Phil into a cartoon. So there you go. Uh, this is a, a, an illustration I did for an editor's magazine where I compared the cartoonist brain to the editor's brain, just to show you how different they are. First, we have the cartoonist brain. The largest thing on his or her mind is, of course, toilet humor. <laughs> then, then you have things like winning a Pulitzer, keeping his or her job, and that tiny, tiny little part of the cartoonist brain that is taste. <laughs> All right, then you have the editor's brain. Now, there are many women editors, but I had a man, so that's why I drew a man. But editor's brain, he's thinking about things like not offending readers, keeping the publisher happy, winning a Pulitzer, kissing up to advertisers, the bottom line, and that tiny part of the editor's brain that is sense of humor. <laughs> so, as you can see, they don't really match up, and so oftentimes we were like this. Uh, but now the good news is I had some great editors at the Post-Gazette. The last one, um, before, I mean, before the last one, <laughs> Uh, Tom Wazaleski, he was, he was fantastic and he would actually call me and we would talk about the ideas because I was working at home at that point and uh, out of my home studio and we had a good relationship and he would always make the cartoons better if they needed to be made better. Uh, he would tell me if, they, if, I was, if I was going in the wrong direction. Um, so it's very rare to get a good editor like that and so I was, I was very happy to have him. Um, <clears throat> and that's why it was such a shock when everything sort of went upside down. Um, here's, here's a little bit about the process of cartooning. You know, it doesn't just automatically happen. We have to sit down with a piece of paper and, and pen. And um, so let me draw you a picture. Uh, step one, find a topic that begs for satire. Now, I drew this during the campaign, so this is why GOP candidates compare penis size. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Step two, choose the perfect metaphor. I can't draw genitals in a family newspaper, but hands are okay. Things with small hands, baby, watch, T-Rex. And then step three, create a rough sketch using your favorite sketching tool. I don't recommend the fork, but... Uh, this, is, uh, this is my actual sketch from my sketchbook, and so some people prefer using a pen, uh, some sketch with a pencil, and then some use a tablet. <laughs> Uh, step four, transfer the sketch using a light table or some other black magic. Um, I use a light table for mine. I, I draw it right onto the Bristol. And then uh, step five, ink the cartoon using an inking tool of choice. <laughs> step six, add color either by hand. Uh, some people do everything on one piece of paper and, and they have a color original when they're done. And then others like me, I use uh, the computer and I use Photoshop. So or do it digitally. Why isn't this working? And then finally, step seven, stand back and watch as readers react to your brilliance. I don't get it. Give it a sec. I still don't get it. Give it another sec. I don't have all day. And here you can see the, uh, the rough sketch in the, out of my sketchbook and then the ink uh, version where I flipped it because I felt like it made more sense if he was walking left to right. And then, then the color added on the computer there. And there's the finished cartoon. So. Uh, my small hands don't seem to be slowing me down at all. <laughs> so that was a pretty tasteful way to, to tell a penis joke, right? I mean, uh, but I got it in the paper. And the, the, now, the reason I, I want to show you this is, is, you know, people ask, well, you know, are cartoons important? Do they have an effect? All you have to do is look at an editorial page with the cartoon on it, and your eye is immediately drawn to it, even before they started running these in color. You know, the, the cartoon made the most impact, so it's really kind of hard to ignore that image. So that also gives the cartoon an extra oomph that you can't get from these sort of graying editorials. Um,
Now this is just to sort of show uh, a random week during the year of 2018. Uh, this was right before the new editor came along, just to kind of give you an idea of what kinds of cartoons I was doing during that week. So this is the week of February 11th, 2018. This first cartoon is about the, the tax cuts that, uh, that were passed. Budget deficits are a mortal sin. They will inflict unthinkable pain and suffering on our grandkids. They will trigger the coming apocalypse. On the other hand, deficit exploding budget and tax cuts for the rich. So, you know, I love how the, the Republicans are always just, you know, like all uh, angry about, about deficits as if they're, you know, going to destroy the world. But then when it's to their advantage to have deficits, they're like, oh, yeah, sure, fine. This was uh, about Pennsylvania gerrymandering. You know, you guys are close enough to PA to understand this. Uh, here's the elephant saying, um, the Supreme Court says we have to redraw it, but it's a work of art. <laughs> and that is, of course, Picasso's Guernica about the, the Spanish War. Uh, here we have, oh, this was also the same week in February when the Winter Olympics were happening. So here's uh, a USA guy, uh, they, they were in Korea. And he says, one Korea, isn't that a bit naive? You mean like United States? <laughs> See, now that's, you know, the thing about that cartoon is it's funny, but it's true. It's just part of, it's about the partisanship that we have going on in this country. But it's not actually taking one side or the other. It's just stating a fact. So I do, you know, I was doing cartoons like that that were just sort of observational without being, you know, without taking one side or the other. Uh, this is a local comic, and I won't go through the whole thing with you, but, um, but I would do, uh, this is the mayor coming into it, uh, I would create this fictitious diner. Uh, it was called Brood on Grant. Grant Street was where the mayor's office was. So, so they, he would come into the diner, it would be a, a comic strip every week. Um, and this was about Act 47 being under the state regulation, and so he's excited about that. But um, it's, you won't get it, so it won't. <laughs> this was right after Rob Porter uh, was fired for domestic abuse. And, and of course, it was just one in a line of people that Trump defended who was accused of that. So I figured, why not just start a shelter, you know, and, and for men battered by accusations of harassment, groping, and domestic abuse, including himself. And he's saying somebody has to defend due process. And then, of course, it was also the same week uh, of the Parkland shooting, which, you know, has become an all too common thing in America. Uh, so I drew this cartoon, as American as baseball, apple pie, mass shootings, and failed leadership. So that was, uh, that was the end of that week. Um, but that, that's sort of an average week. So I would do everything from local politics to, you know, to gerrymandering, to, to gun shootings, to uh, taxes. Um, and then there was a, you know, there was a Trump one in there too. But... These are the Trump cartoons that actually made it into the newspaper uh, while I was still working there. It's kind of amazing, some of them. Uh, this one is just about his tweeting. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> you know, nowadays I wouldn't draw this cartoon because I'm assuming he has some credibility to begin with in this cartoon, but I really don't believe that anymore. Um, these are the Russian chess pieces. You have king, queen, bishop, knight, rook, and pawn. Um, here's Nixon again. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And you would be... That was when he fired Comey, sort of like the Saturday Night Massacre back in Nixon's day. See, I told you I'd build a wall. Uh, this, is, this is a cartoon about Trump and his denial of climate change and denial of science, basically. Um, there was a climate report that he just sort of poo-pooed, and so I thought, well, if I drew him as a storm, it would have to be a baby storm, so it would be El Nino. And there he is with his little Twitter rattle, you know. This is the cartoon that I actually can't believe they published in the paper, but they did. Um, this was right after Charlottesville. And my editor was a little nervous about it. He said, I don't think the publisher is going to go for it. And I just said, well, you know, do your best to convince him because I really feel strongly about this cartoon. And I think it, it'll be in my 
you know, my, my entry of my Pulitzer package when I, when I do it next year. So, so I kind of bribed him to, to, to keep it in there, and he did, but he wasn't happy about it. Um, this was right after Puerto Rico, and uh, of course Trump was golfing during the national emergency, but uh, when he finally did go to Puerto Rico, he just tossed paper towels. And, um, this was based on a famous photograph that somebody had taken of, of Trump from behind when he was golfing, and it was not a flattering photo, to say the least. Um, you're an unhinged, childish, nuclear despot with insane hair. I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> yeah, I could do cartoons for days on these two. You know, they're just like... Uh, this was just, you know, this was just my homage to the famous poster, uh, the Jaws poster from the 1970s that I loved, that movie. And, um, and this was Laws, and we have Trump swimming along, and here comes, here comes <laughs> Jaws. But, you know... If, you know, this was drawn, you know, back in 2018, so now we might, we might, uh, we might call it gums or something, you know, because it didn't have the teeth that we quite hoped it would, but, uh, all right, so now to the killed cartoons. So every cartoonist, you know, who's ever drawn cartoons for a newspaper understands what it is to have cartoons killed. I would have one or two a year killed. And that's after maybe, you know, having several others, you know, adjusted or, or, or changed something because, you know, I work with the publisher, I work with the editor trying to make the best cartoon I possibly can. But if he's not going to run it, you know, we had an arrangement that if, if they didn't like something, they could kill it and I could still send it out for syndication. But I never wanted that to happen. I never wanted it not to be in the paper. So I would try to do my best to change it if it could be changed. Um, but one or two a year. Here's, uh, they usually had to do with the Catholic Church in Pittsburgh because it's a very Catholic city. This was after the Boston pedophile scandal first was, uh, came into, into the news. And they were also still looking for Osama bin Laden at that time. So here's Osama bin Laden saying, I heard this was a good place for evildoers to hide. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you can see why this one didn't run. Uh, this was another cartoon. This was Benedict when Benedict was... Uh, was talking, uh, he, he was giving Easter masses, but he was ignoring the Irish pedophile scandal. So here I have the bishop saying, it's the annual hiding of the pedophile priests. <laughs> and you can see on the little eggs, there's the priests, <laughs> priest collars. Uh, so I got this one finished because originally it was, it was approved to go in the paper. And then, um, but just to give you an idea, it was supposed to run on Good Friday. So, <laughs> so when, I opened the, when I opened the paper the next morning, it wasn't there. So. The nice thing is a week later it ran in USA Today as the top cartoon in their roundup. So I was like totally excited. Um, this one actually did run, but this gives you an idea of what kind of cartoons they would, they would put in. This was uh, when Benedict and the, and the Vatican got their first Twitter account. Here he is, OMG, this 21st century technology is great for spreading my 15th century views on gays, women, and contraception, LOL. <laughs> and then, wait for it, hashtag say 10 Hail Marys. <laughs> <laughs> that one, I, I, that was one of my favorites. I'm glad they, they ran that one. Um, this one was a, a little more controversial. It didn't get killed in Pittsburgh, but it was, uh, it was one that sort of uh, struck a nerve in other places. So this was when South Carolina was still using the Confederate flag above their courthouse or their, their sit, state, state house. And so I have a guy sitting there saying, I like to look up the flagpole and see a symbol of our Southern heritage hanging there. What's so wrong about that? Yeah, so, so this went through many editors in the newsroom and all of the African-American reporters looked at it and, and everybody sort of had the same response. They sort of said, ooh, and then, they, and then they said, but it's a good cartoon, we should run it. So, so they all felt like it was worth the risk. It ran, it, it really got mostly just praise in the city, but then it, it was syndicated to a small Christian university in Oklahoma City and it caused a stir. There, there, they, had a, they had a big protest of all of the African-American students, and they fired the editor, and so, you know, it, it ended up having a, an effect somewhere else. But, uh, but it just shows you that, that it, it is a powerful image, and it can have a powerful effect. Um, okay, now, back to present day, or at least a year ago. Um, this was Memorial Day weekend, and I was doing... Uh, cartoons ahead of time to go out of town for a cartoon convention. And the first one I did was a Memorial Day cartoon, and I'll show you that one next. But that one got killed, and so I, I came up with this one, which was about the NFL. 
And this was when the NFL decided, okay, we're not going to let anybody kneel anymore. You know, it's just bad for business or whatever they decided. But they decided this is their proclamation. So I thought, okay, new penalties, illegal use of free speech, uh, flagrant disrespect for the troops, and prompted unnecessary rough tweets from Trump. And, you know, I thought, okay, there's a little, little Trump reference there, but they're not going to, they're not going to kill this because it has nothing really to do with Trump. But because Trump was so involved with this whole NFL story and because it's about racism, I guess that's why they killed it. So they killed this one and then they had killed my original idea, which was this one here, Memorial Day 2018, truth, honor, and rule of law. Now this one I kind of knew would, would not go over well, with, especially with the new editor who had been killing cartoons. Now remember I told you I would get one or two cartoons killed a year at the most. That's, that's over 12 months. This guy was there for three months as my editor, and in that time he killed 18 cartoons. So that gives you a sense of what was happening. Uh, but I was trying. I was, you know, like this one got killed. I tried to do the other one. They killed that one. So then I get back from the convention. I'm working on the next day's cartoon, and, and it's about the Starbucks closing down for racial sensitivity training. And I thought, okay, well, I'll do NFL closing down for racial ignorance training, you know, because I figured that was something that they would do. And uh, no Trump reference, nothing. And still, this one was killed. So then I was getting confused. Um, the next day, uh, Roseanne Barr tweets uh, some racist things and gets fired. So I think, okay. Well, I said, there's an obvious cartoon there. So I drew the sketch and I kind of knew it wouldn't get, get picked up. But it was a couple watching TV and the, the woman says, you know, despite the racist tweets, I really like this sitcom. It says a lot about America. And the wife says, uh, I'm sorry, honey, that's, that's, that's not a sitcom, and they see that it's Trump on TV, right? So that was my first idea. They killed that one. And then I'm like, I don't know what to do. They're just killing my cartoons, and they're not giving me any explanation. I'm asking for reasons. They're not telling me. So then she, she comes out later on the news and says, uh, maybe it was the Ambien that made me tweet racist things, right? So I'm like, okay, I can do that. So I did this. Here's a guy, you know... KKK guy sitting in the doctor's office and he says, could it be the Ambien? You know, and you know, it was just a simple cartoon about a simple issue, just sort of like making an excuse for racist tweets. And I thought, surely they'll, they'll run this. And at first they said, yes, it was on the page. It was approved. And then later the publisher came in and said, no. And so I think by that time he was just trying to send me a message of some sort. Next morning, I woke up and I wrote him a long letter and said, what's going on? You know, why is this happening? Never heard back from him. Uh, but in the meantime, after fretting about it all morning, I realized, oh gosh, I have to draw today because I don't want them to say I'm not doing my job. So I quickly came up with this one. And I figured I don't care if I draw Trump now because it's, it's in the news and, and Trump was uh, separating children at the border. So I did this one and this ended up, you know, I did this really quickly, but this ended up being the cartoon that kind of went everywhere for me. And a lot of people picked it up. Um, and then finally, the last day of that week, I drew this one about his pardons. And, uh, you know, he was pardoning different people like uh, Jack Johnson and, and uh, Scooter Libby. So I just thought, okay, he's, he's gonna pardon people like Manafort. And um, so I did this one. It just seemed like a harmless cartoon, really. Uh, and they killed that one. So that was six in a row, six cartoons in a row. So by this time, the media had picked up the story. They were asking me to comment. I, I said, I can't comment because I'm still employed, but they won't tell me why it's happening, you know. So it was sort of a standoff. They weren't talking to me, um, but they were killing the cartoons. Um, we can talk more about later. We can ask, you know, when you, we open it up for Q&A, we can talk more about what happened in the ensuing week and a half. But eventually they did fire me. And, uh, and the first thing that happened was New York Times called and said, do you want to write about this? So I wrote an article about it. And they asked me to do the drawing for it. So the funny story here is that, um, you know, as an illustrator, you, you, it's different than being a political cartoonist that has free reign. As an illustrator, you have people saying, you know, uh, art director saying, 
Uh, yes, no, maybe. And so I told them the whole story. I said, you know, the, the, they want me to now start submitting. They wanted me to start submitting three sketches a day, and they would approve which one they would use. And if not, they would come up with a better idea. That was what the Post-Gazette was suggesting. And so I'm telling the New York Times this whole story, and they're like, oh, that's great. Put that in the story. Put, that's great stuff. Now, we need an image to go with this. So could you give us three sketches... <laughs> I swear to God, they, they were not even saying it as a joke. They, they really, well, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. So anyway, of course, they picked the one that I, you know, this was, I mean, it was a good choice in, in the end, but it was the one that I liked the least, you know, so th that, that's what happened. But, um, but that story ran, um, and then The Nib called, which is a, an online comics format, and they wanted me to do sort of a long-form comic about my getting fired, so I, I did... This, here, I'm only going to show you a few panels. It's in the book if, if you want to see it later. Um, Donald Trump cost me my job. You're fired. Okay, he didn't actually say that, but he might as well have. After 25 years as the political cartoonist for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, I was fired in June for being too critical of the president. I started my career at the press in 1984, and Reagan was running for his second term. And you can see there I use the specialized Grecian formula for the, for the hair. This is the first time I've ever drawn my publisher it was in this cartoon. So, uh, The PG has always been a left-leaning paper. The publisher, John Robinson Block, mostly kept his politics to himself. Liberal rag. Uh, in 2015, that began to change. He was enamored with candidate Trump and started hinting about an endorsement. What about our, the moral stands we've taken for decades? Nah, what do we know? J.R. began to push back on my cartoons about the Donald. Tell Rogers his cartoons don't capture the intoxicating masculinity of Trump. My editorial page editor, who championed and defended me to management, took a buyout in 2016 rather than endorse Donald Trump. I'm so alone. So that's, those are the first two pages of it, but it goes on from there. It's a 24-panel thing. And, uh, um, and so basically... The beat goes on. Trump continues to be president, despite me, you know, not wanting him to be president. But, uh, uh, and, and really, I'm continuing to do what I've done all along, which is get up every morning and, and be outraged so I have to say something and draw something. So, so I'm still syndicated. I, I draw three a week for syndication. I do freelance work now. I have, um, I have a, a, a Patreon page that... Uh, where I can interact with the fans and show them rough sketches and different things like that, talk about the cartoons. Um, but I'm still, I'm still working. So here are some of the cartoons I've drawn since being fired. Um, and I just have a small sampling here. This was, uh, this was Colin Kaepernick, intentionally raised awareness about racial injustice, unintentionally raised awareness about human sex trafficking. That's Robert Kraft of the Patriots who was caught with. And now, see, here's an artistic designed thing. Since I had Kaepernick with the helmet, I wanted to mirror the image, so I had to think of what could I put in Robert Kraft's arm that would be similar to a helmet. So I came up with the, the giant jumbo bottle of massage oil. Well, and I should say, we have some, I have some that I'd like to show as well, so if you want to wrap up. Yes, uh, almost done. This is about uh, the uh, drug profits. They're highly addictive. Side effects are lying, more lying. Here's one about the free press. Uh, sign a non-disclosure. Oh, this one I like just because of Bill Barr and the Mueller report. And he's, he's saying, who needs the Secret Service? <laughs> this one was one of my favorite of the rec recent months. This was after the shooting in El Paso. And, you know, there's been so many shootings where they've been repeating some of, uh, some of Trump's rhetoric. Now... The reason I want to show you this cartoon is just to show you how quickly things can change for, for a cartoonist. I drew this cartoon well before the, like two days before the, the whole uh, Sharpie Gate incident happened. And here, here we have climate is a hoax, FEMA funds will go to the wall. I've never heard of a Category 5, even though there have been four Category 5 hurricanes during Trump's presidency. So this was my cartoon, about, basically about the hurricane and about his response to the hurricane. But then... He goes on and draws his own map, right? So I'm just like, come on, man. And uh, so somebody please take away his Sharpie. Here he is. Alabama will be ha haunted by Dorian. Uh, polar bears, or the ice caps are fine. Here's my border fence. And then finally, people, people love me. 
And then this is today's cartoon. I just thought I would include that. Uh, this is him saying, we'll never forget until I'm president and I invite the Taliban to Camp David. So there you go. Thank you. Oh. One, one quick thing. We may not have Boss Tweed around anymore, but we do have Boss Trump. So that's why, that's why it's important to, to keep that in mind. All right. Thank you, you so much. Sure. Please have a seat. Um, well, your book, which is available uh, for sale in the lobby, uh, signed copies, is called Enemy of the People. Right. Um, you talk about the importance of satire in today's political climate. Satire has been important in all of the years of this democracy, right? Mm -hmm. um, have there been other times in this country's history where you think cartoons and satire played a necessary role, something that really changed the course of things? I mean, I, you know, I think that, yeah, there were probably different centuries where this happened that I wasn't a part of, but the most recent thing that comes to mind are the cartoons that were being drawn about the Vietnam War and about, uh, about Watergate. Um, I know that, you know, when I was in college, I was looking back at some of those cartoons and, and sort of, you know, looking at how important they were in that, in that whole process. And I think that, uh, I think that even when you look at something like the McCarthy, uh, when, when, what Herblock was doing, you know, Herblock, you know, was single-handedly saving the post at that time because, because he was a famous cartoonist and he actually had to loan the Washington Post money to keep it afloat because he had more money than they did at the time. And, and they gave him, what they did was they ended up giving him, uh, you know, uh, shares in the stock. And then, of course, he became <laughs> incredibly wealthy. But, but anyway, yeah, I think, I think there's been many periods where satire has been very important. I also think, for instance, during the W years, um, something like The Daily Show has taken on a new role of importance because a lot of young people are getting their news from uh, comedy. And that's unfortunate because, you know, you would hope that, that the news deliverers that are out there would be better. But, but I think it just shows the importance of satire because it's sometimes easier to understand things and easier to swallow things when you hear it. And, and you, also, you also get a sense that people, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks this is absolutely ridiculous. Look at, you know, look what's happening. And, and, and then you laugh about it and, and you can get up the next morning. Right, so, so satire is important, I would agree. And my research that I've done shows that people, young and old, are confused right now in 2019 about what is satire, what is fake news, what is real news. Mm -hmm. How can people, how can you help as an editorial uh, cartoonist, political cartoonist, help people distinguish what is real, what is satire, and what is fake. Do news outlets need to do a better job of explaining the role of editorial and opinion pages versus the rest of the news? I feel like a lot of people just don't understand that distinction. I, I think what's happening is it does seem to me like some, there is a, a portion of the population that has lost their sense of humor and lost the ability to laugh at themselves. And so, yes, in that regard, um, they're missing the whole picture of satire. But but I do think that, you know, um, it's, it's incredibly important for, for news organizations, especially ones that, you know, pride themselves on being, you know, the standard, to call out fake news and to also, also dispel the notion that anything that they don't agree with is fake news, which is what Trump is, is, is sort of pushing and the, and the Republicans have been pushing. So I think it's important to make that distinction. Yes, it's very important. And I think... What, what cartoonists can do is just to keep hammering away at the ridiculousness of what's happening right now so that we all can feel sane. Well, uh, one of my students, Katie, from uh, our National Agenda class, there's a course associated with this class, and they have to ask, uh, they're required to propose questions. She asked, I thought, a pretty compelling question. If you could go back in time and change the content of your art to align more with the vision of the publisher and the editor, would you, or do you feel like you're better off having left? Oh, no, absolutely better off. I mean, I think that what was going to happen if I hadn't been fired is that I would have had to have worked under the conditions that I'd been working under for three months. And, you know, just ask my wife. She said, <laughs> she said, I've never seen anybody who loves their work more than you, but I've also never seen anybody who in the last three months is more miserable. So... So it, had, it was definitely having an effect on me, and I, I, I definitely got a sense that, you know, 
if this hadn't happened then, it would have happened eventually down the road. But no, I, I'm, I'm very happy that I, you know, I, I, it's not that I took a stand, it's just that I, that I actually had, you know, something that I believed in that I didn't want to change, so. Well, let's go back to the history of cartoons. Um, this is a cartoon you published uh, related to what you just discussed earlier with Boss Tweed. Right, right. Um, and how Thomas Nast in the late 1800s, early 1900s was a really important political cartoonist in the 19th century. And the series of cartoons he drew exposing this corrupt Tweed ring. Is anyone familiar with this story? Mm -hmm. um, Tammany Hall. Yeah. Tammany Hall contributed to the group's ultimate indictment and became a right. landmark in the history of journalistic crusades against corruption in the government. In your cartoon, uh, you said, he says, stop these damn pictures. Oops. Oh, yeah. Um, what did I do here? Oh, no, I'm going the wrong direction, just yeah, like see, you did. I, I, You're not the only one. I'm not the only one. <laughs> oh, oh, the animation's goodness. not working on it. Um, yeah, I think the so, animation's not working. Yeah, the animation. What was so the, the, the caption here is, uh, finally, a newspaper I can get behind. You know, right, like, and, and so and this, this was, is a this result was, of the New York Times International Edition. Right saying that they are no longer publishing political cartoons. What does that say about the future of political cartoons? Uh, it's, it, it, it says that people in positions of power, especially, you know, publishers of, are, are, are becoming more afraid. And they're afraid to have opinions, they're afraid to express opinions in the paper, because they think that by dumbing down the newspaper, somehow they're going to sell more copies or they're going to get into less trouble. But it also, it also has to do with pressure from investors. So if, like, I don't know what their situation was at the New York Times International Edition, but if they were having pressure from investors or advertisers, or, you know, there's a lot of people that could come in and say, you know, hey, no, we don't want to do this. Um, so one thing I want to say about Tweed that I didn't finish the story of is the reason that, that his cartoons are so amazing is Tweed eventually went, I mean, uh, Nast. Nast uh, uh, yeah, Tweed eventually went to jail and for his crimes. He escaped prison and he went overseas and he was working on a ship in Spain and somebody recognized him from the Thomas Nast cartoon, and from the caricature. And so that shows you what an what a important thing a cartoon can be because the, when they recognized him, they arrested him, brought him back and he served out his, his well, he died in prison. But... Um, but yeah, that was a pretty remarkable story. I don't think that's ever happened to one of my cartoons, but. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, so let's look at a few of your more recent uh, cartoons. Okay. And I'm gonna ask um, one of my colleagues if, one of the things I asked you on the way over here is perhaps if we could bring out a sketchbook and a Sharpie. Oh, yes. If, I think we forgot to bring one out. Oh. But if one of my <laughs> colleagues might be able to do that bet between our my conversation and before we open up the Q&A at 8.30, um, we were thinking of drawing a caricature of maybe one particularly important Delaware native, <laughs> Delaware uh, uh, folks. So, um, Who goes by the name of Uncle Creepy? Is that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Not in I'm Delaware. Kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not in Delaware. No, not no. here. Not here. Not here. Not <laughs> here. All right. <laughs> I'm going to move forward to uh, an, uh, a cartoon that my students were particularly uh, prof was prof particularly profound. Um, so this is a cartoon with uh, looking at um, ice versus uh, 1969 when we're walking on the moon. This right. is a, a very different experience than we've had um, in, in previous years. So what is it about this image that my students found particularly powerful what makes it so meaningful? What thoughts go into your decision making uh, once you've come up with this idea? The mirroring image, I think, mm -hmm. is really powerful from an artistic perspective, and I'm curious how you came up with that. Well, this is another one that, that kind of popped into my head right away because what you, what you have here is, you know, the TV coverage of that particular event um, when it was hitting, you know, when it was, what is it, the 50th anniversary? Is that right? Yeah. Um, they you know, they were doing all of these sort of love stories on the news about this, this time in history. And of course, we always look back on things and think, oh, if only we were yet during that time again. But, but I think they were juxtaposing it. What they were all saying without actually saying it on the news was, yeah, compared to now, I mean, look what's going on now. So I immediately thought of the two images, you know, just like I thought, okay, the image of him standing there with the flag, iconic, 
what's the, what's the new iconic image? And, and that's what made me think of the... Well, I think another thing that, that I definitely thought of when I invited you here was in uh, 2015, we saw the um, tragedy at Charlie Hebdo in Paris, which uh, was just four years ago, left 12 people dead. Mm -hmm. He worked for a French satirical magazine. Can you remind us why they were targeted and talk just a little bit about the international support that became your cartoon, Je mm -hmm. suis Charlie? Yeah, so that was, that was one of the worst horrible, worst things that had ever happened in, in our small community of editorial cartooning. So um, Charlie Hebdo is a magazine, a satirical magazine in Paris, and they do a lot of outrageous stuff. And so most of the cartoonists that I know would admit that, you know, there's some pornographic stuff with the Pope doing things to different politicians. And, you know, there's all kinds of crazy, uh, over-the-top, you know, pushing the envelope kinds of cartoons. Cartoons that I would never draw. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the right to be able to draw them and the people found them funny and the magazine was supported and everything else. So it was just tragic when that happened and, and everybody knows the story. But, um, but there was an immediate outpouring from the entire world of cartooning and, and of course the entire world as well. But everybody realizing that speech is, is powerful, this kind of speech is powerful, cartooning, and in some instances, like this one, it comes with a price, and that's unfortunate. So let's move on to um, another image here. Uh, so this is the transatlantic mitosis oh, cartoon right. that came yeah. out recently. And um, before I reveal the whole thing, uh, I, I think it was great that you sent me these images piece by piece, I think it's important to kind of be able to differentiate between one frame from the next. But one of my students who asked in class today, Mandy, was asking, you know, do people need to come at these cartoons with a particular sense of political knowledge, or they can, mm. can they get what's happening just from the picture? So we'll start here. Okay. So maybe you can walk us through. Yeah, so, um, so this, is, this is sort of Trump in cellular form. <laughs> uh, you know, just, just sort of being in the fluid of chaos and, and misogyny and racism and isolationism and lies. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't remember to put misogyny up there, sorry. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's sort of his, you know, primordial stew, whatever, whatever you want to think, say. And how we've seen this, we've seen what's happening with Trump happening in other places, including the UK. So the next one, you see they start to separate, you know, like like mitosis, and eventually you end up with, with Boris Johnson and uh, Brexit. And, and so, yes, in this particular case, if you had not heard about Brexit or Boris Johnson, you might, you might look at this and be confused. Why are there two Trumps, you know? Um, but uh, hopefully the caricature is good enough that you would recognize it's not Trump, but it's somebody that looks a little like Trump. Well, what I wonder, though, is that could some people be turned off by this because they don't know the wonky history behind it. And if you think about a lot of political cartoons and you, mm -hmm. you've had to give some context behind some of the ones you've mentioned tonight, they're really ephemeral. Like they're yes. very much based on what's happening in that time. And like mm -hmm. you kind of forget, oh yeah, George W. Bush said this or right. Barack Obama said that. So it, are you concerned at all that like, that a couple things, that people won't understand them and that there won't be a historical sort of like when people look at them in the future, that well, they will understand what it actually meant. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a, a, a definite point because I, I've gone to the cartoon li research library in, in, at Ohio State and, and at the Library of Congress, both places, and I've looked at old cartoons, and some of them are confusing. You know, you're like, well, what was this about? Right. Um, so that is a concern, but it's also part of what we do. I mean, we're, we're there to sort of hit the moment and hit the zeitgeist of what's happening right then and there. And everybody knew what was going on with Boris Johnson for the most part. So if somebody saw this cartoon that wasn't somebody following me already, uh, you know, on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, if this had been in a newspaper, <laughs> which, you know, it wasn't this time, but if, you know, if somebody had opened a newspaper, they would usually open that paper knowing what's happening in the news because they fo they're following my cartoons or they're following the editorial page. So generally, that's why I didn't label them. I, I, you know, I could have put like Boris and I could have mm -hmm. put, uh, I didn't, did I? Okay, good. <laughs> I could have put Trump and Boris, but I figured, you know, these, this is happening right now. Everybody's hearing about it. So yes, you do have to have a certain amount of, of 
you know, current events knowledge to, to, to get into it. But I think, it's, I think it's safe to say that if you don't, if people don't know that, then they're probably not looking at the cartoons, you know, if they're, they're not interested in the cartoons, if they don't have a sense of what's happening. And if they do have a sense and just don't get this one, they can look it up. I mean, that's what I do when I see a cartoon. I've, this has happened to me recently, actually. Somebody, some of these stories come up so fast on, on Facebook. I'll be working on a cartoon all day and I ha will not have heard about something that happened. And somebody will do a cartoon, you know, and put it out immediately and I'll be like, what is that? <laughs> well, and that, that brings me to a question that I, I meant to bring up earlier, which is like, are memes the new cartoons? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please no. do not say that. No, they, they are, they are, I think that memes and political cartoons are, you know, are sort of in the same, you know, genetic family, even though the meme is sort of the, you know, the, the uh, illegitimate stepchild. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, that's what memes are. They're political cartoons. And, and I think that now that we have a, 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 you know, a, a platform where anybody can do it, you know, they can just post a photograph and put a text, you know, any, anybody can be a political cartoonist. So that makes it tougher for us because we're fighting against the memes and, and the, the cat videos, and, you know, all the, the little uh, things all that people cats. are putting up. Yeah, so many cats, so, so many little cats. time. Well, uh, <laughs> I only have a couple more minutes left before we hand it over. This was another cartoon that um, really uh, felt powerful to me. This is, um, I'm really curious more than anything, uh, how a political cartoonist consumes news and tries to interpret it through satire in 2019. You talked about in class today, kind of this fire hydrant of information right. being, being right. thrown at you. And um, I, I was wondering, as with many things in the Trump administration, if, as we often hear, like, if Obama had done this, we keep hearing this mm -hmm. kind of like, well, if Obama had done this, if Obama had met with a, a North Korean dictator, yeah. um, there would have probably have been a different response. From oh, Americans. he would have been impeached in five minutes and he would have been out, you know, I mean, So, so what went you through your mind as you processed this incident? So, you know, I, I had, up to this point, I had done many cartoons about, you know, Kim Jong-un and, and, and Trump, and I'd done some about uh, Putin and Trump, and I even did one that I don't, didn't have in the show, but it was a, a, a romance comic, you know, with, with uh, Trump kissing Kim Jong-un, and, and Putin is off to the side thinking, oh, no, you know, my, 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 you're supposed to be with me. You know, so, so there's this weird thing he has with dictators. But when I saw, so, so that's, that's bad enough, right? But when I saw him go to the DMZ and do a photo op. The demilitarized zone. Yeah, demilitarized zone. There is no, I mean, he's giving this guy the credibility of an American presidency and, and Kim Jong-un, and he does not deserve it. I mean, he, he is a brutal dictator who murders his own people, starves his own people, and he is developing nuclear weapons to take out allies. And so here he is giving him, uh, you know, the platform, the stage, the national, the, the world stage, uh, and legitimizing him. And that, to me, is, is egregious. Now... I, I added in this sort of this idea that they're stepping over the line to the demilitarized zone of, of supporting a murderous dictatorship, and that's what we're doing. So. Well, um, before we jump into questions here, I found this quote from Salman Rushdie, whose fourth novel, The Satanic Verses, was the subject of major controversy, as a lot of us probably know, provoking protests from Muslims in several countries, death threats were made against him, including a fatwa for his assassination, mm -hmm. um, issued by Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini in 1989. Um, he said in 2012 in a New Yorker article that art is not entertainment at its very best. It's a revolution. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if do political cartoonists from these different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different geographies, do they face different threats um, in this field of cartooning? How do, and how do cartoonists support each other in varying democratic and autocratic regimes? Well, believe it or not, there are, there are organizations that reach out and try to help cartoonists in other countries. Um, it's um, the Cartoonist Rights Network in, in Washington, D.C., and, and my organization that I belong to, the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, we support them uh, every year. We bring in a cartoonist of courage and we give them an award from if, if they can make it. Sometimes they have to do it remotely because they're in hiding or they're in jail. Um, but. I mean, there are so many examples. There's, there's the, the Syrian cartoonist who was, had his hands broken so he wouldn't draw, 
any more cartoons. There's uh, obviously Charlie Hebdo. There's so many examples. An Iranian woman who was drawing the parliament as animals, she got a, a year in jail for that. And uh, so, so we, you know, even though this is, has been a difficult year for me and, uh, and kind of living through this, I, I also know that I'm still in a country where at least we have the semblance of uh, freedom and I'm not in jail, so that's good. <laughs> All right, well, before we toss it to questions from the audience, and I'll ask uh, Justin and Charlotte to go ahead and get that catch box ready to go. We have uh, a cool feature where we have a box that you can throw around, um, and our two uh, students from my class and our intern are going to um, basically help you engage in a conversation so you'll be able to toss the box around to each other and ask questions. But I figured while we're getting that ready, um, it looks like we do, do we have, have our sketchbook oh, okay. off stage and a looks like oh, great. Are Thank those you. your oh, you markers. These. That's right. That's great. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Well, okay. I was thinking in between this q and I, I know it's a huge sketch pad, um, <laughs> but I'm thinking That's all right. since you're in Delaware, and you do caricatures yes. <laughs> of politicians. Right. Could you show us the process of doing a caricature of former Vice President Joe Biden? I can, I can try, yes. I, I, do you have your, uh, is your, is that your iPad? Can you bring, I left my phone back in, oh, the, sure. in the green room. Can you put up a picture of him? Uh, I can. Uh, so, yeah, so I was you drawing work him. from pictures primarily? Yeah, with people that I haven't drawn uh, over and over. Well, here, I, I'll start with, uh, you know, somebody that I can draw in my sleep now because I've drawn him so many times is, is uh, George, well, Trump, but you've seen enough of Trump, so I'll draw, um, I'll draw uh, George W. Bush. Can you see this? Uh, I'll turn it around once. I, but as I said, the caricature started, started to get so his eyes were like really close together, you know, and really beady. And his nose sort of had that almost like a bird beak uh, feeling. And that's kind of how his... His father's uh, nose was too. And then the eyebrows got a little bit thicker and a little bit thicker till finally they were kind of like, you know, one of the Muppets. <laughs> you know? And then, uh, and then you know, the, the, the mouth sort of echoed the nose and, you know, always sort of a downturned mouth, even when he was smiling. If he was smiling, I would make it go up like this, but it was still that little pointy thing there. Um, And then, yeah, but I drew him for eight years and, and through two wars that uh, we didn't really need to be in, and now we're trying to get out of the second one. Um, but uh, there was a lot to draw with him, I mean, a lot. He has the jowls, and then, of course, you know, the thing that, you know, he did, his ears stuck out just slightly. But not that much, you know, not that much. It's just that when a cartoonist starts to go a certain place, the next time they say, oh, that looks good. I'm going to keep going. And then, you know, eventually it was like this, you know. So the ears became these sort of missiles, you know, like, like the military could use them. But if only he listened to the American people with those ears, right? <laughs> Thank you. you see it? <laughs> Uh, well, okay, so I'll do... The I'll, only I'll picture do... Biden I could find... Oh, there you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. Oh, right there. wonderful. That's perfect. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you to the guys in the booth. <laughs> I was going to show the one of me with Joe Biden. Oh, you have ago. one of you and Joe Biden. Well, oh, it was wow. on this stage. Oh, there you go. Appeared, um, wow. With John Kasich, but uh, that's a better picture. <laughs> yeah. So with him... So tell me... What oops. The... Uh, those are your... These are the ones from earlier. Those are earlier. Oh, yes. yeah, you have one, Joe Biden one there. But, uh, oh good, look at that, I can, I can turn around and do this like this. Um, so the thing about Joe is, you know, he's got, he's got a high forehead there. Uh, and then, you know, he's got, he's got his nice row of uh, hair plugs there that go across. And then, uh, <laughs> the nice thing is they, you know, they've all turned white so they, it kind of blends in. Uh, and then you got, uh, you know, a little bit, of, he keeps it a little bit longer on the sides, you know. Um, and then, and then the eyes, you know, he's, he is, I will say that he is somebody who smiles all the time. So he's sort of, I mean, that's kind of his thing. You know, he, he just seems like he's always happy. So his eyes, 
become these sort of like squinting half moons, you know, like that. Uh, and of course, in this picture, he has a nice crow's feet going on there too. Um, the eyebrows. Um, and what then, I found most noticeable when he was doing this in class today was like, you already can tell who that is, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just from the eyebrows and the eyes. And then, and then of course, his, the thing that defines him the most is that, that smile. Now, he's not smiling quite as, as wide here as the picture we found earlier, but, you know, he's got this, you know, this amazing uh, ability to show, show his teeth, you know. <laughs> And, you know, just, to sh just to, so you know what those are, I'll put that there. And then, uh, and then of course... Um, you said you're still working on the chin. chin. Yeah, the chin, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out where his chin goes. It's not quite a, a Bill Clinton chin, but it's not... It's a little bit more like Obama's chin, I guess. Although Obama's chin's a little bit longer than that. He's got the ears. And then, of course... Um, then, of course, you have to have the hands reaching over the shoulders. <laughs> now, now, who do we want to be, who, who should we put in, uh, you know, I didn't leave much room here, but I guess we could make it. Uh, you can put me in there. You can put, okay, all right. That's fine. I'm fine with that. All right, I'm going to draw like a mini version of you because oh I didn't God. leave enough room for your... <laughs> So your head's going to be really tiny, so don't, don't, don't. Uh, I do have a tiny head. So don't, okay. don't get mad at me for that. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm not saying anything about your head, you know, really. What's that? <laughs> Bloody eyes, what? I don't know. So while, <laughs> while we finish this up, and hopefully, is our photographer still here? Uh, maybe, yes, that'd be great if you could take a, we can do it afterwards too if, you, if that's easier, but, um, but let's open this up. We've got about 21 minutes left for a Q&A. So Charlotte and Justin, please come to the front and anyone and everyone, raise your hand if you have a question for this political There, there he is, Uncle, <laughs> Uncle Joe. <laughs> <laughs> See, I made you tiny. <laughs> it works. <laughs> At least she's not sniffing her hair, you know, so that's good. Oh, my that's good. goodness. <laughs> you are harsh. I know, I'm harsh. <laughs> there you go. This is the life of a political listen, cartoonist. Listen, huh? I, drew, I drew Joe Biden back when he made all those gaffes, um, you know, in the 1988 election where he, he mis you know, he started, you know, stealing quotes from other, other uh, campaign speeches. So I, I, I've drawn him for a long time, but, uh, but now he's back in it again. He's going to get, he's going to get some heat. He's definitely going to get some heat this time around because he's the front runner. So we'll see yep. what happens, but. Uh, All right, we have our first question. Yes, oh, somebody has talk the cash the, box. Talk into it. <laughs> so I. Uh, oh, it's an actual microphone. I yeah, know, that's, that's cool. I listened to your interview on NPR, and one thing that struck me tonight um, that was different or new was uh, you talked about college newspapers who have syndicated your cartoon, who the editors have gotten fired. What did that mean to you? How did you feel about that? I was upset about it because I felt like, um, you know, this was... You know, in, in, when I when I did some research, when I when I emailed the when I read the story about what happened, and when I emailed the woman who started the protest that 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 um, ended up getting this poor kid fired, who was just this like you know a student editor. I hadn't heard about this. Um, oh, this was back in the 90s. But but the problem was um, there had been other racial incidents on campus, racial insensitivity on part of the, on part of the, the, the management, or, I mean, the, whatever you call it, the board of, you know, regents or whatever it is. So it wasn't the first time, but, but this, this, this one cartoon, um, apparently for this woman, this grad student that, that was upset by it was too much. And, and her point was, well, showing a lynching of, uh, even in that form was, is just horrible. You shouldn't do it, you know. I disagreed with her because I felt like if we don't look at these things, we don't look at our history, we don't look at who we were and change from it. And, um, and our, well, what she said to me was, she said, well, 
What if somebody were reading that editorial page and then said to themselves, yeah, lynching, that's a good idea. And I thought, and I said to her, I said, well, first of all, I don't think the kind of people that would be lynching, uh, uh, you know, African Americans would, would be reading the editorial page of a, of a college newspaper, for one. Secondly, um, they already think that way. They're not, they're not going to look at the cartoon and get the idea from the cartoon. So, and, and, the sec and the third thing is, you know, the cartoon's message was the opposite of that. So, um, but, you know, her point was well taken. It's just that I thought that she overreacted to in, in how, you know, how it happened. But, but it happens on a lot, of, a lot of campuses where people get upset about something and they, and they have a protest and somebody either gets disinvited from coming to the campus or, or you know, or somebody else gets fired. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a touchy time right now. And that, that was, you know, 20 years ago. But, uh. mm -hmm. Yeah, and we deal with that here. It's, um, and we pride ourselves as a university that's based on open inquiry and uh, mm -hmm. free and open expression. So that's part of what we do here at National Agenda. And um, just as we're hearing from the left, we'll be hearing from the right um, in uh, future conversations, particularly with Chris Christie, I think will be an interesting one to come to. That is uh, November 6th. Oh. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> I was going to sh show my drawing of Chris Christie. So, <laughs> do we have another question? <laughs> Charlotte, there's one way in the back yes. there. And then uh, maybe we'll jump back over to Justin. Thank you. So, um, that story was of an instance where someone else thought one of your part one of your cartoons went too far. Mm -hmm. Do you have any that stand out in your long career as a cartoonist that you would take back given the opportunity? Uh, actually, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of having good editors is those were all taken back for me. So for instance, I, 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 there were a couple where I went a little too far and it was either, you know, the, the picture was too, uh, you know, like uh, maybe I was showing a massacre or something and, and the editor said, well, you know, that might not be the best way to get that point across. So I came up with a better idea. So in other words, uh, there, ha there are, when I look back at most of the cartoons that I've drawn, there are definitely some where I say, where I say to myself, that drawing isn't very good or I could have punched up that punchline a little more or, but I don't really have any that I think, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, more, more what, more, what happens to me more when I look back at them is I think, wow, how did I get away with that? <laughs> you know, I'm surprised that, that, that they let me run that. Um, the one, one thing that comes to mind is during the Iraq war, uh, or no, I'm sorry, during the Afghanistan war when we first started bombing, um, you know, I was doing cartoons about the people, you know, in Afghanistan, like you know, the women and children who are waiting for these food drops from, from you know, the charity organizations and, and the bombs are coming down and, and the woman says to the child, remember, just catch the food only, you know, and not the bombs, you know. And my editor called me in and he said, do you realize that we're, you know, we're in favor of this war in Afghanistan even though you're drawing? And I said, yeah, I know. And he's like, okay, just making sure you knew. And he was fine with it. You know, that, at that point, it was okay because they knew that, you know, we were going to differ from time to time even on something like that. But yeah, more, more, it's more about sort of realizing that I, I, was, I was very privileged to be working there because I was getting, getting stuff in that other cartoonists might not have. Uh. Let's take a question from this side. Hi, um, I was kind of on a lighter note. I was wondering um, <laughs> how much you had to like practice your signature to get it that distinctive. <laughs> no, like genuinely. No, this is, this is, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> You know, when I was in college, I was fascinated with, uh, uh, I didn't really want to be a political cartoonist when I was younger. I wanted to be a cartoonist. I, I you know, I had, I had been drawing, you know, the comics out of the Sunday funnies. I could, I could do a, a really good Peanuts, you know, Snoopy and Charlie Brown. And, um, and then later, and I made up my own stories and would keep little notebooks. And then later on, I, I ended up um, wanting to work for Mad Magazine or something like that. So then I get into college and I go to the paper and I say, you know, I have these cartoons that I've drawn for different things. Would you ever need illustrations? And they, and it, it just happened that they said, well, actually we need a cartoonist, an editorial cartoonist. And I was like, okay, I'll try that. 
So then once they, you know, once the cart first cartoon made a big stir and everybody was like, oh, you know, and I thought, oh, this is, this is cool. So I, so then I started researching and seeing, like, I suddenly saw all these signatures, you know, and I thought, oh, I got to work on my signature. So I did. I practiced it for a long time until it, until it got just, just right. Uh, and it, even when I started at the paper, it wasn't, it wasn't quite that, um, you know, well, that's not a good one, but, but yeah, you can see it on my cartoons. Um. I can do it pretty fast when I'm drawing it in the, in the paper, but I remember one time early on, my first year that I was working there, my editor comes in and, I'm, and, I'm, and I've got the whole cartoon laid out. It's all penciled in, everything's penciled in, and I'm starting with the signature down in the corner, you know, I'm doing, inking, inking in with a brush. And the editor comes in and says, it figures you'd start with your signature. You know, you're spending half your time on that. Why don't you spend some more time on the drawing, you know? <laughs> so anyway, well, but yeah. And if you do want to purchase one of uh, his books, which I have here, um, they're out in the lobby, and his signature is in the front of them, except, all except for mine. So oh, I haven't signed yours you yet. To, yeah. You need to do okay. mine, okay? <laughs> With a little drawing of, uh, of Uncle Joe. Right? Yeah, of course. Um, all right. Well, I think uh, in the light of, of time, I'm going to um, do a little bit of what is something new for National Agenda, which is called... Doc Hoff's quick take. I keep telling people that I'm trying to get this to catch on. I think a couple of my students have finally been like, okay, that's what you want. I'll call you Doc Hoff, fine. Um, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a way of being like a little more personal, but also like I got a PhD, so like, you know, call me doctor. So, <laughs> so this week I've been thinking about the state of journalism in 2019, and I have an image up here um, about a new initiative out of a, a local paper in Mansfield, Ohio, um, and they are doing these listening posts, uh, six listening posts uh, from between, they started on Monday, they're doing through October 14th, an election listening tour called Talk the Vote. And this is a membership-only newspaper. They're about five years in, and they do not take subscriptions. So it's a new model for really like local local journalism. And being from, or uh, having gotten my degree from the Ohio State University, um, <laughs> I have a, a close connection with Ohio. And what this made me, reminded me of, this is my quick take, is everything 90s is kind of back again, right? Like fanny packs. I saw a fanny pack today, <laughs> crop tops, uh, you know, you name it, acid wash jeans. And when I was a student about your guys' age, my students here, um, in the late 90s, as a journalism student at the University of Kentucky, there was this fad called civic journalism or public journalism. And I was fascinated by this idea. I thought it was really amazing. It's basically the idea of bringing people together, uh, bring people in the community together with journalists, with news media, radio, television, newspapers, to have forums to say, what is it that you want to know? Um, mm -hmm. The question here says, uh, what, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? Instead of dictating the horse race. Today, Washington Post just came out with horse race head-to-head uh, um, -head coverage of Biden versus Trump and all these things. And mm -hmm. it's, it's frankly not very useful for a lot of citizens to mm -hmm. be thinking about what issues matter to them. So I, I think I kind of want to just conclude by saying, like, I'm all for the 90s. I'll even take the mom jeans back. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good with the 90s. I think that journalists need to own up to their duties to really give citizens what they need to know. This is a very difficult media environment to navigate. Fake news, satire, we talked about these things. So I think what local journalists in particular can do is, is really engage with their communities and ask them, what is it that you need to know in order to vote? So that's my quick take. <laughs> Uh, I want to end with saying that we have our uh, annual um, audio essay contest. Uh, this year, the theme is Speak Up. Um, it's open to University of Delaware students. Prizes, students. <laughs> These are good, right? Money. Um, I remember that being important. It's actually kind of still probably important as a professor. Um, but we want you to tell your story. Uh, our next speaker is um, the third of our more left-leaning speakers out of all of our speakers. His name is Jamel Bowie. He writes for the New York Times. He's a cultural columnist. Um, if you have been following the 1619 Project in the New York Times, he has written for this. I don't know if mm -hmm. you looked at 
with that at all? Yes, yes, it was fabulous. Yeah. Um, so he will be here on September 25th, so we have a week off until our next uh, uh, speaker. And uh, really, I just want to say thank you guys so much for being here, and I hope to see you again. Thank you, Rob Rogers. Thank you.